And to all those of you joining us here at NBCNews.com on the web, we welcome you. We have now uh, seated ourselves with part of our panel of experts, correspondents, former government officials who are now of counsel to us. We have Pete Williams here at the table, our longtime justice correspondent. We have Andrea Mitchell here at the table, our chief foreign affairs correspondent. We have Michael Leiter here at the table, who is the former uh, director of the National Counterterrorism Center under both President Bush and President Obama. With us via satellite, we have Chuck Todd, our chief White House correspondent and political director. And we have former ambassador to Russia, Michael McFall. He is out at Stanford, where he's a professor these days, having discovered the private sector, former <laughs> member of the national security staff at the White House. Uh, and uh, ambassador, maybe you are a good place to start vis-a-vis -vis, uh, what you heard okay. Snowden say about Russia, about Vladimir Putin, what stood out to you? Well, first of all, Brian, I learned a lot, uh, and I look forward to the conversation here. Uh, I had not listened to Mr. Snowden for an hour at any time anywhere else, obviously. Uh, it was interesting for me because I remember the day he arrived in Moscow when I was still the ambassador. Um, I, I guess a, a couple of things jumped out at, to me. Uh, and I wrote them down. I, when uh, the, your discussion about why Moscow, why was he there? And I, I note the passive tense, the, the, the structure of the sentence, right? I was stopped uh, in Moscow, uh, but he wasn't stopped in Hong Kong with the same uh, status uh, with his passport. I remember that very vividly. And so when he's asking, well, ask the State Department. I used to work for the State Department when he showed up in Moscow. Uh, I found that very mysterious. Well, if they let him get on the plane in Hong Kong without a valid passport, uh, why was he forbidden from going on? And who was forbidding him, right? <laughs> uh, Russia's a sovereign country. Uh, let me tell you, uh, two years living there as an ambassador, uh, they do things their own way. Uh, they abide by their own rules and their own laws. And if they want to uh, give him the ability to fly on to Havana, they most certainly could have done that. So that was the per first piece that struck me. The second piece that struck me was his discussion about his relationship with the government. Uh, I, I wrote down that he said, I have no relationship to the Russian government. Well, that's just not true. Uh, you don't get to get on a call-on show with the president of Russia and have no relationship with the Russian government. And by the way, just to remind you, on that call-in show, he, he asked, I thought somewhat naively, Mr. Putin, President Putin, do you, you listen in uh, to uh, telephone conversations of Russian citizens? He told you, I know they have a very professional service. So that's rather strange to say you have no relationship with the government, yet that kind of interaction happened. And I would just remind uh, your listeners that his lawyer, when he first arrived, Kucherena is his name, as somebody well known to us as being very close to the Russian government. So uh, those were the two pieces that struck out, uh, stuck out to me th at the first blush. Okay, let's go around the horn here in New York. Pete Williams, it strikes me you have had a foot in both worlds. Um, a long time ago, you worked for the government, you worked at the Pentagon. You've been uh, on the right side of the fence for quite a while now as a journalist <laughs> uh, and our longtime justice correspondent. As you watch this hour, what flies through your mind? What do you uh, kind of rank in order as the ambassador did? I was struck by the fact that it's been 35 years since the U.S. Supreme Court really defined what privacy should be in terms of our telephones. Uh, this was a case of a man who was harassing a woman. The, the FBI uh, police put a pen trace on his phone call and said, you know what? The Supreme Court said you have no privacy interest in the phone records that go to the phone company. Those are business records, who you call, what numbers you call, how long, and so forth. Clearly, things have changed since then. Uh, it was enough of a change to have one federal judge say, you know what, based on that standard, that's, that's so far out of date that people use their phones in an entirely different way. We have to take another look at this. Not enough of a change for another federal judge, though, who upheld the program. But clearly, because of these revelations, because of these court cases now, the Supreme Court's going to probably have the final word on whether, in fact, what the government has done here is unconstitutional. You know what I was thinking about today? A, I think it was a dissent Justice Brennan wrote in a case about the presumption of privacy in trash 
left at the curb. It was a California case that went before the court, right. and I was thinking about how much time has changed. Yeah, and the answer, by the way, is you have no privacy interest <laughs> in the trash you throw away. Depends where the uh, can is. Exactly. <laughs> once, you, once you push it outside away from the house. But privacy is a very important thing. And I was talking to, if you'll pardon me doing a little name dropping here or, or position dropping, a member of the Supreme Court who was asked, what do you think the big issues are going to be in the next 15 or 20 years? And this justice said, without a moment of hesitation, privacy. Okay, you trump me. I was quoting a Brennan opinion. You're <laughs> quoting an actual, an actual living justice. Um, were you, um, to me, the consumer takeaway from our hour was the, the part where I held up the phone. Okay. I was being honest about Googling Rangers Canadiens the night before. That really got my attention. We may have known that intellectually, all of it, but to hear it in his hands kind of methodically go through why people would be interested in somebody Googling a hockey score was quite something. Yes, and the other part of this, of course, that's become kind of a discussion, discussion point uh, is the fact that um, the, uh, the Internet service providers are very interested in that, too, and that probably... For the average American, there's more privacy intrusion by Google and Yahoo and, and, uh, and commercial establishments who want to know your every move than there is the NSA. That, that couldn't be why there was an ad for New York Rangers apparel on my Google page the next day. I thought it was just a happenstance. Andrea Mitchell, uh, same question to you. I was struck by the cell phone learning how you live from your apps. Wow. I mean, that... You know, the Ranger, Googling the Ranger, Canadian score, and the drafting of the emails. You know, I have studied this. I have reported on this now for a year or more and knew the capability exposed by Snowden. And now it's become almost part of his part of the American conversation because he exposed it. But until you hear him describe it, it doesn't become viscerally, you know, part of your life. And that really got to me. I had read the transcript uh, a little before the show. And hearing him and that exchange really became very real. I, there are other technical points that we have been trying to fact check. Uh, John Kerry jumped into it today and said, well, why was he going to Cuba? Well, that is not factually correct. I just wanted to point that out. Uh, Snowden is correct. He was, by all accounts, trying to pass from Moscow through Cuba, a transit point, to get to Ecuador or another friendly Latin American country that would not grant that would grant him asylum, it would not extradite him to the United States. So he wasn't trying to be in Cuba. And I was struck by his comments about Russia, about the lack of privacy and Internet freedom. He was somewhat critical of Putin and of Russia on the issue of privacy. He seems to have been radicalized. He says, <laughs> if, you, if, you, you know, if, you, if you take his basic motivational uh, experience, as he describes it to you, uh, he says 9-11, he, you know, joined the, he tried to join the special forces and washed out. Right, the Tar full arc of wanting to exactly. serve and then getting soured. And then going into CIA, becoming a contractor. What officials say to me is, yeah, but why did he then uh, join Booz Allen, the contractor he joined in Hawaii, specifically after meeting with, with the journalists, specifically at that point so disillusioned that he went in for 90 days to download and then, you know, say he had a medical emergency and then, and then go on the run. So that's, that is the counterpoint to that. All right. Michael Leiter, um, uh, it's, I guess you're now in the private sector, but you weren't for a long time. And uh, you were around for, the lo for a lot of the policy policymaking. So much of what has motivated Snowden is about what morphed, what Right. changed after 9-11, um, the war in Iraq that was launched in the name of 9-11. Um, so what... Uh, maybe this is because I'm the one on the panel who, who is the most recently out of the intelligence community. Michael obviously was in more recently than I was. But really two things, two things stuck me, uh, struck me. The first was his absolute confidence that he hasn't done any harm. And I have to tell you, I, I find that naive and pretty gravely mistaken. This belief that a lot of what has already come out, he can't identify an individual who was hurt, hence there's been no harm. 
I think if you look at what's come out, how the U.S. intercepts information for the Islamic State of Iraq, the terrorist group in Iraq and Syria, how the U.S. intercepts information about the Syrian military, about the Russian military, how the U.S. protects its spies overseas from operating and not being covered by foreign powers. I can't give you the names of the people who've been harmed by that, but I think it's really hard, and I would, I would venture to say impossible, to say that there's not a real harm there. So I think he's just both mistaken and naive. The, the other piece which struck me in that same conversation about the cell phone, which I think can be striking to some people, that it, at the close of that, he used a really two interesting words. And all of this is unregulated and uncontrolled. Right. And I think that really does show, I don't want to call him a 29-year-old clerk, but I think it shows a naivete about how these things are regulated and are controlled. And there's a perfectly good argument to say they're not regulated enough, they're not controlled. But to say that this was happening, happening haphazardly or unregulated and uncontrolled, I think is really well, wrong. But do you deny that it's ever been done for sport? I mean, he at no, one point in the interview Brent, talked about um, the frivolity behind the scenes the, where you'd call a colleague over and say, hey, look at absolutely. this. The, the, the love end, right? Looking at who right. your ex-girlfriend right. called. I think that's a really important point. And I think it's important to distinguish between those individual violations where people are reported, self-reported by the NSA, and they should be punished. In many cases, they were fired. And then whether these programs systematically were violating the rules set. And the fact is they weren't violating the rules set by the Congress and by the FISA court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act court. But in his view, they were unconstitutional. Now, again, I think we've seen from the discussion that has come after his revelations that, in fact, that balance maybe wasn't struck correctly for the American people. But that's a very different sort of violation than those individual violations of people doing those things. Andrew Mitchell. Um, he describes himself as a conscientious objector, and I'm thinking to myself, he's thinking of himself as coming out of the tradition of Thoreau. You know, it's, civil it's disobedience so, was the term. Civil disobedience, yeah. rather. Right. I don't mean conscientious objector. Thank you, Pete. Civil disobedience. I mean, this is a very different... This is his sense of self. But at the same time, I have still have a lot of questions about his description of the whistleblowing, of raising the alarms. Uh, as you reported, we've found evidence of one email. It could be that the NSA covered up other emails, that the paper trail he says exists because he said they were multiple attempts, right? Uh, some verbal, but some unwritten. And we've only found from our sources one example. It was in April of 2013. So I, we're foeing it, and it'll take them forever to give it to us. And I asked one top official, do you think they could be lying to you and not turning it over to the legislative branch? And this person said, I can't be 100% sure. That is the degree to which what Snowden has revealed has infected even... Uh, the supporters of the government program, surveillance program, their sense of the credibility. One because we, we do pe think that yes. people are lying to us about it. You asked him, uh, when did you decide to start to, to, to leak this material? Yeah. And Glenn Greenwald says in his book that Snowden decided to take his final post in Hawaii for the sole reason of getting access to documents to leak. What Mr. Snowden told you was that when he was in Hawaii, he was still raising these objections internally. There's a bit of a conflict there. All right. let, let me, you know, I, I'll play the recovered lawyer, because um, that's what I am. Uh, imagine you're the general counsel at the National Security Agency, and you get an email which says, listen, I think that you're violating the law here. This is unconstitutional. And the general counsel gets this note, and he says, well, gosh, the Congress has authorized this over and over. The FISA court says it's okay. Well, Mr. Snowden, I appreciate your interest, but I've got two other branches of government who are pretty good at understanding the Constitution, and they say it's just fine. So regardless of what he raised, this is an awfully odd whistleblowing act for them to know what to do is with. That, is that really what that counsel says, knowing that in war powers times, this was not FDR telling Chrysler they're going to switch to making tanks, but the Bush administration use of war powers with Bush and Cheney, isn't the general counsel at the NSA a little bit so, on guard for a perversion as, as Snowden And, and I it? think when, if that email comes in in 2004, 2005, before some other revelations in the New York Times about uh, initial collection programs, 
That comes up and then you get scared. But post 2004, 2005, 2006, the Congress has been told about this. The Congress has approved it. The FISA courts have approved it. So yeah, maybe the general counsel kind of wonders, but he still says, should I listen to Edward Snowden or should I listen to the FISA court judges that have repeatedly approved this for the past five years. Chuck Todd in Washington so patiently. Um, <laughs> we're, we're talking about um, Snowden's contention. If, if somebody could just show me harm. Right. Uh, right. Earlier tonight from the White House lawn on Nightly News, you were talking about something readily, uh, re readily understandable uh, to all civilians, and that is how tough these documents have made it for the White House to do business around the world. It has been, for lack of a more grandiose term, embarrassing for the president, for his career foreign service officers, for the secretary of state, diplomats everywhere. Well, I was trying to, I was trying to explain why was John Kerry so personally mad? Uh, and it was the same you, you sort of poke, and when you do Snowden uh, inquiries to the White House staff, to national security folks in the White House, you know, the first inquiry will be sort of, you know, we're not going to get into it. And then you keep poking, and they just explode with anger. And the anger all centers on not what he took, but it is goes to this embarrassment uh, of how this has set back America's image around the world, particularly in Europe. You know, there are some there are some people uh, you talk to in Europe who say America's image in Europe now is as bad today, post Snowden, as it was during the Iraq war. That all of the goodwill that President Obama uh, essentially was promising to bring back, restore Americans, rep America's reputation around the world, completely erased by Snowden. And folks in the White House believe this, un they, they say, unfortunately. And they blame Snowden and they blame these revelations. So they get really angered. But before, I, I, not to, to hijack things, you know, one part of this conversation that I think we've, we've not talked about is just, and I can't tell you how many emails I've gotten about this, both from friends, family, colleagues, who are just stunned at how this 30-year-old man is so calm, cool, and collected in an interview like this with you, Brian. When we've seen people who have never done TV before or done TV very rarely not be able to handle five minutes of an interview, and this guy sat there for hours. He was amazingly, he was, it's stunning how prepared he was. Yeah, I, I've been asked about that internally. A, he had time to think about it. And, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, well, but, that's true. But B, uh, it was very interesting. He was very measured. Um, we had Pete Williams and Andrea look over these transcripts. We had a whole family of people kind of um, scouring the transcripts, people within our news division, right. um, and everyone was struck that it, it read like a book galley. It, it was complete sentences. It was complete orderly thoughts. He, would, he never left an argument dangling. He would come back around and finish it, and that's the way it went. We probably, I, I don't have a clock on it, we probably spoke for between three and four hours, we were kind what of... What was your longest break? Um, I'm just curious. You know, it was really technical because we were overseas using European-based equipment. We had, to, right. we had 32 minute tapes. We had to break every 32 minutes or if we saw a break coming, we took on nourishment, we took on fluids. It was like quick turnaround of a Southwest jet and we would get going again because we didn't want to lose the thread. So, I mean, nothing more than a couple of, uh, of minutes. And um, he, he was the way he, he seems on camera. Um, Ambassador McFall, you are the most recent person, obvi obviously, in the Foreign Service. Chuck Todd tonight on Nightly News said that every member of the Foreign Service is used to by now that uncomfortable joke are you recording this conversation should we go ahead and say hello to the nsa we've been making the joke around the office ever since we've been in receipt of these tapes i kind of treated my phone like an extra person in the room all weekend and i'm sure you encountered this in your job well i did and i, I do want to talk about the damages because he did start off at the beginning stating i can't think of any damages and let me just talk about three different parts uh, first of all, 
uh, direct damage to our bilateral relationships. I was there, actually I was there with you, Chuck, at the G20 right. uh, in September, and I remember some very difficult meetings that the president had uh, with close allies of ours. That's damage to the United States. If you're a patriot, you don't want to damage our relations with our allies. Secondly, just the, I also was very struck by your conversation about the phone, right? It's something I know well, and, and Michael knows this well. We would brief people when they would come to Moscow to talk about Russian capabilities. But millions and tens of millions of people will look at that and think, wow, that's really how it works. And in that community of people who are doing that right now are our enemies. Uh, and just be aware that, that that's a direct uh, uh, constraint on our ability to gather intelligence on our enemies. They're more self-aware of what we can do. But number three, I experienced every single day after Mr. Snowden arrived in Russia, the, what you, you all were just talking about. When, when I wanted to talk about violations of democracy and human rights in Russia, which I did frequently as ambassador, the first question back to me was, well, you're just, you do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it was very frustrating to me that our, our image abroad was damaged by these revelations. And that, that gets me to my last point, which is I, I'm all for the debate we're having about our Constitution. Uh, I don't know enough about the legalities about whistleblowers, but it seems like just sending one email to a general counsel is not really a campaign uh, to fight for the Constitution. But, I don't, but that's one place. What I don't understand is this other piece that has only to do with national security. How does the information released about that in any way make our Constitution stronger? And I just wish he would have thought a little harder about that. I was very struck when he said, maybe I could make mistakes. Uh, that's a mistake I think he made uh, that, that is not, in my view, uh, in the national interest. All right. You mentioned the Constitution. Uh, so does Mr. Snowden. We promised uh, viewers here on the web, uh, when you distill as long a conversation as we had, one of the great frustrations of doing commercial television is we had to fit it all into the hour we were given. Um, we have portions of the conversation that have not yet aired. And here is the first one of them. This is about the Constitution. The Fourth Amendment, as it was written, um, no longer exists. Uh, the, the problem with it, uh, the reason we have that difficulty, is one very specific interpretation that the government has made in secret. And that's that the uh, Fourth Amendment's prohibition against uh, unreasonable search and seizure can be separated. And the government has decided, uh, again in secret without any public debate, uh, without anybody in Congress, uh, without, not at anybody, but without the body of our representatives in Congress knowing, is that now all of our data can be collected without any suspicion of wrongdoing on our part, without any underlying justification. Uh, all of your private records, all of your private communications, all of your transactions, all of your associations, who you talk to, who you love, what you buy, what you read, all of these things can be seized and held by the government and then searched later for any reason, hardly um, without any justification, without any real uh, oversight, without any real accountability for those who do wrong. Um, the result is that the Fourth Amendment that was so strict uh, that we fought a revolution to put into place now no longer has the same meaning that it once did. Uh, now we have a, a, a system of pervasive pre-criminal surveillance uh, where the government wants to watch what you're doing just to see what you're up to, to see what you're thinking even behind closed doors. Pre-criminal surveillance, it's a weighty term. Uh, Pete, I am not, as you know, a constitutional scholar, but I've read my David McCullough. <laughs> and uh, as far as I know, the Fourth Amendment had as its derivation the frustration and anger of people like uh, Madison, people like Adams, who, and this came up in our conversation with Greenwald and Snowden in Moscow, John Adams taken the rutted out, muddy post road from Quincy, Mass. down to Philadelphia, not a treat in itself, tired of getting harassed on the road, tired of thinking that his wife and family back in Quincy are sitting in a house that could be entered at any time, 
Fourth Amendment reads, and this is good for everybody, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Now, uh, none of the framers could anticipate the iPhone. Uh, none of the framers anticipated we'd be dealing with abortion uh, as a contemporary issue. But the document through the justices has proven elastic, a living, breathing constitution, as they say. Uh, Snowden thinks the Fourth Amendment is not, as he put it, worth the paper it's written on, that it's because of what he witnessed, it's dead and gone. Uh, this is a tough one. Well, I'm sitting here with a former <laughs> Supreme Court clerk, by the way, but um, in, I think in a way he's won the argument in part on this. And there is the, the part is that uh, the government's ability to get all phone records ever made in the U.S., all the metadata, they call it, and put it in a great huge tank and then go look at it whenever they have a reason to say, we think this phone number has been used by a bad guy. Uh, but to hold that data, uh, you know, he's probably won that argument because the House has just voted to put that data in charge of somebody else and the phone companies themselves and not the government. So it appears that that's going to change. Uh, so, you know, I guess you could say that, that he, because of making this public, there were internal complaints about this. We know members of Congress didn't like it and didn't buy this legal analysis. Well, that is going to change. The broader question about whether the government can look at somebody's emails overseas or email traffic as it's going by, uh, that's a very different question. And the Supreme Court has said in many cases you can do a search without a warrant if there are so-called exigent circumstances. People rushing across the border, uh, you know, people driving in a suspicious part of town, whatever the reason may be. When you go on an airplane, you are searched. Right. There's no search warrant. But the government has said that public safety is an exception. So there are lots of exceptions to the Fourth Amendment. Uh, it's, not, it's not like all parts of our Constitution. It's not absolute. It's always a weighing process. Right. Michael, first of all, full transparency, what justice did you clerk for? I, I clerked for a justice who I think is widely viewed as pretty protective of the Fourth Amendment, Justice Stephen Breyer, um, appointed by President Clinton. Um, I have to say, I appreciate that he thinks a lot about the Fourth Amendment, but I think both his facts on the programs are wrong and his analysis is shoddy. All right, um, Counselor, but how, how am I secure sure. in my person and my effects if my government can turn on the microphone and camera when I'm in my house right. and listen to and watch me? It sounds really, really scary, and in most cases, the government can. And what Snowden said in that interview of that the government can just collect all this data, have all this data, search it all the time, know who you love, know who you talk to, just isn't true. What the government can do is have some data about the phone calls that you make, not the substance of the phone, call, phone calls, but who you call, when you call them. And then what they can also do is after they go to a, a court that reviews that, they can look at that. They can't listen to your phone call. They can't turn on your camera and look at you unless they've gone to a court first. So he's just mistaken about some but of Michael. that. He, he would say that court has no adversarial procedure. Right. And that it's basically I, a rubber stamp for I, what the government... And that's exactly what he called I it. I think that... I think the criticism of the FISA court, which doesn't have an adversarial process, is not entirely unfair. Well, so except you have a more this, robust process, it's the yes. Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. It's not... It, it doesn't even the, the doesn't even contemplate the NSA using this against you because you're not a foreign target. Well, but that that's not quite true, Pete. Because when you're talking about one, terrorist cases that two. are foreign okay. terrorist organizations, the NSA would be working with the FBI and get that. So it's fair to say it's not the same thing as a regular court where if you're investigating a drug case, you have a defense attorney and a prosecutor. That's right. But then there are other protections in there. Now again, he would say. They're junk. They're not meaningful. But the way the system works is he doesn't get five votes. This is why you have justices. This is why you have courts and you get this hashed out. Although now, this, this, I mean, again, the other side of this would say it's never been to the Supreme Court because it's always been secret. Right? This is a chance to get it there. That's right. 
And that's why you also have a Congress involved, and that's why it's reauthorized and the like. I do think that his view of the Fourth Amendment, it's right that it often lags technology. The Supreme Court's, you know, they don't know what's coming up, and they look at something that's been around for five or six or seven years, and then they judge that constitutionality of it. May I just briefly make one point here? Sure. I, I, one of the things that I constantly hear from the people I cover is that he confuses the capability of the NSA to do something with, with the claim that they are doing it. Right. Uh, and that he, exactly when, right. when, you, when you asked him about examples of where are they doing this to Americans, he didn't have any. And that is one weakness or one criticism of him and Greenwald that I hear all the time from people and in government. one other quick okay. thing. Okay, yes, then I'm going to call a timeout to get some business done. And that is that those so-called reforms, people in the intelligence community tell me they are delighted with the House bill, uh, that it actually gives them more leeway than they used to have and a little bit of political cover. So these reforms that have come post-Snowden are not going to work the way he might imagine. To Messrs. McFall and Todd, be happy you're not here because it's getting ugly in New York. We'll get to you, <laughs> we'll get to you in just a moment. Uh, to all those joining our conversation on, on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, Brian, what was your take on his body language and demeanor during the interview, asks uh, Kathy Cooper. Uh, the beauty about, you know, a 60-inch flat-screen HD television is <laughs> you basically saw what I saw. You saw eye contact when he made it. You saw when he didn't make eye contact. You saw how he was sitting. What you saw was also spread out over four or five breaks. He went back and assumed the same uh, kind of sitting position. He would take long pauses. There are points that didn't air just because of germaneness where he would stop himself apologize for either losing his train of thought or for looking for a better word uh, but in, in his uh, kind of um, uh, aphorisms idioms speech patterns vocabulary selection if anything it was a little bit of another conversational era he had a very proper way of speaking uh, halfway to refreshing in that way uh, Tony Jackson, what additional information did Snowden give about his military record and background? Interestingly, um, I said the folklore about you is that you broke both legs in basic training. Uh, and he said, uh, you know, something like, suffice to say, I was not cut out for special forces, look at me. He didn't confirm or deny that he had broken both legs in basic, except that he, he tried in the U.S. Army, that accelerated program, recruitment uh, for special forces. And I made some comment about, uh, you know, succeeding in the military is mostly about heart overhead. And uh, apparently legs got in the way of his experience. <laughs> um, we talked about metadata uh, in this group. We talked about metadata with Snowden. He makes a larger point here about the information haystack and about why, in his view, uh, big intelligence gathering doesn't work. I'll play for you now that exchange. I really meant to. I take the threat of terrorism seriously, uh, and I think we all do. And I think it's really disingenuous for, for the government to invoke uh, and sort of scandalize our memories to sort of exploit the, the national trauma that we all suffered together and worked so hard to come through to justify programs that have never been shown to keep us safe but cost us liberties and freedoms that we don't need to give up and our Constitution says we should not give up. But you can see how it happened guys with box cutters spent 200 bucks using our own aviation system to take down our own buildings and smash into the Pentagon in a field in Pennsylvania. What are we going to do? It's a, it's a non-traditional enemy. The expression is an enemy we can't see. What are we going to do? You know, and this is a, this is a key question that the 9-11 Commission considered. And what they found in the postmortem, when they looked at all of the classified intelligence from all of the different intelligence agencies, they found that we had all of the information we needed as an intelligence community 
uh, as a classified sector, as the national defense of the United States, to detect this plot. We actually had records of the phone calls from the United States and out. The CIA knew who these guys were. The problem was not that we weren't collecting information. Uh, it wasn't that we didn't have enough dots. It wasn't that we didn't have a haystack. It was that we did not understand the haystack that we have. The problem with mass surveillance is that we're piling more hay on a haystack we already don't understand. And this is the haystack of the human lives of every American citizen in our country. If these programs aren't keeping us safe and they're making us miss connections, vital connections, on information we already have, if we're taking resources away from traditional methods of investigation, from law enforcement operations that we know work, if we're missing things, like the Boston Marathon bombings, where all of these mass surveillance systems, every domestic dragnet in the world, didn't reveal guys that the Russian intelligence service told us about by name. Is that really the best way to protect our country? Or are we, are we trying to throw money at a magic solution that's actually not just costing us our safety, but our rights and our way of life? Mr. Leiter, in another uh, portion of the interview, I made the point to Snowden, speaking in terms of devil's advocate, remember what it was like just after 9-11? We all thought, well, I'm not, I got nothing to hide. I'm not doing anything wrong. Go gather. We've been hit by an enemy we couldn't see. As I put it, they spent 200 bucks on box cutters, used our own airplanes, take down our own buildings. Remember what that was like. And um, he's now making the point, when we had a domestic terrorism incident, Two guys named Sarnayev. The Russians try to tell us, hey, you've got these two weaponized guys named Sarnayev. We spell their surnames wrong. We missed that. All this mega data collection, we Still missed that be. because of the size of the haystack. Well, he's right in some ways. If you had a smaller haystack and you knew that that haystack only contained the things you really needed, it would be easier to connect the dots. The problem is... You can't predict up front if the correct information is in the small haystack, so you collect more. So the answer is, the less I have to collect, great. But I don't know exactly what I have to collect, so you have to collect more of it. And I do think he's also right that 10, 13 years into this fight, we do have to repeatedly go back and look at these programs and say, how much value is there? Because they do have an impact on privacy and civil liberties, and we want to balance this. So to the extent we can stop collection and still get what we need on terrorism or counterproliferation or against Russia, great, collect less stuff. But it's not so easy on the front end to know exactly what you have to collect and what you don't have to collect. Pete Williams. I, I would just say, you know, this problem of not finding the Boston bombers was looked at by Congress, by the FBI, by the intelligence community, Boston police. No one said the problem was we collected too much intelligence. And what if we turn the spigot off? You're going to have certain people perhaps running for president, civil libertarians, say just uh, disband the TSA, stop, stop all the listening, and let's go back to, you know, the methods we use to, to investigate evildoers. Yeah, I don't think, I mean, I'd be very surprised if that happened. But uh, I, I will say this. I think while I'm, my own view is, there's something lacking in Snowden and Greenwald's ability to, co to connect, on the one hand, what they think is the NSA's overreach with what it's actually doing to violate people's privacy in the U.S. Um, I, I will say I think they do have a point about, you know, a, here's a question. Do we want to just sort of turn the intelligence community loose and say, get whatever you can? O or should there be some kind of internal controls over that uh, beyond what there are now? That's an um, interesting question. Ambassador McFall had the uh, great distinction of being from Montana and uh, 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 spent uh, a lot of years around uh, Butte and Bozeman. And, Ambassador, I was thinking about this vis-a-vis uh, -vis the following. Uh, I, I've spent some time out there myself, and I have friends out there who don't even like the fact that their car yells at them to put their seatbelt on. I know a lot of... <laughs> Uh, otherwise law-abiding, God-fearing Montanans who drive their Ford F-150 with that seatbelt constantly clicked 
behind them and they can get in and out without uh, government interference. Uh, they have a similar aversion, as you know well, to a lot of speed limits. Um, how do you think Edward Snowden would be greeted uh, in, say, uh, Bozeman, Montana, if he were to appear at the local library to give a talk? I was wondering how you're going to connect Butte, Montana to Snowden. <laughs> I thought that was very clever. Uh, well, I, you know, I would say a couple of things. Uh, it's good to have people like that where I grew up that question authority, that question the, the power of the government. Uh, I think that we have a long tradition in our country that goes back 300 years, not just to the beginning of our country, uh, and that, that makes us better. Uh, and when he said that in your interview, that that's the spirit in which he's doing it, I hope that's true for him and that's what motivates him. Um, at the same time, uh, there are ways to challenge authority uh, that don't do damage to our national security. Uh, there's a lot of people in Montana that are worried about terrorists, Brian. There's a lot of people who are worried about threats to our country. And it's a balance, uh, but I think it's not an impossible balance. I, I think it's very important what one of your, I can't see who's there, but somebody said about capacity versus action. We, do we want to, to unilaterally disarm? Uh, my answer to that is absolutely not. That would be crazy, especially if we're thinking 10, 20, 50 years down the road, thinking about new adversaries, growing adversaries that are not disarming. So that would be, to me, not, uh, uh, you know, just not wise. But we need to be able to use those capacities for our national security and not violate the Constitution. I think we can do that. Andrea Mitchell. But we have to be smart about it. I, I agree with, with Mike McFall, but the institutions, the bureaucracies that have grown up this crazy system of 16 intelligence agencies and a Huge. director of national intelligence, and no one has really run that effectively. How many billion? And how many billions of dollars is a classified number? Blackout number in the budget. So that hasn't worked if an Edward Snowden can go in and scrape all of this stuff, for potentially 1.7 million documents. They don't really know. He denies They still that. don't know what he took. They know what he had access to because they can follow his tracks, but they don't know what he downloaded because he was copying it. And so they have no way of knowing what he did. Now, they've changed the system, supposedly, where there's a buddy system where one person can't key in the way he did as a systems administrator, which was the title. You know, he made the point that he had a much broader and deeper uh, reach and, and effect. But we've created a bureaucracy that clearly isn't working. And it isn't making us safer in that extent. We're collecting, as he said, you know, this enormous haystack and we're not able to access it and, and target it as effectively as we ought to be. Uh, Kevin Tibbles is down in one of the places where uh, Edward Snowden uh, uh, lived, and that's Ellicott City, uh, Maryland. And Kevin, you watched, uh, correct, with some local folks there? Brian, we're at the trolley stop, which is a historic watering hole here in Ellicott City, just outside uh, the city of Baltimore, also a bedroom community of the D.C. area. The bottom line here tonight, Brian, was that no one really knew what Edward Snowden sounded like. And there was a real hush that went through this establishment this evening when Edward Snowden started to speak. People were really trying to get their minds around what he had to say. What was he really like? What would he come across as being like? And a number of people's minds here uh, who have told me since uh, the interview took place, their minds were changed. A lot of people seem to be sounding a little more sympathetic towards what Mr. Snowden says that he has done. Many people are saying perhaps that this was something that had to be brought to the fore. They, many of them noted that, for example, he said that he tried to be a whistleblower within the NSA community, and that was rebuffed. And that is the reason why he has ended up in Moscow, Russia, uh, giving this interview to NBC this evening. But at the same time, many in this group do say that they are very disappointed with the route that Mr. Snowden took in making this point to the American people. And that is something that, is something that they are still buzzing about behind me here. Uh, now, Brian, and that is that that how do they how do they get their minds around the fact that they may be appreciative of what he, he has said that he has done, but at the same time, his methodology is something they still really can't 
countenance. Well, Kevin, let me ask you this. The, the kind of uh, subtext question we asked at the top and bottom of the broadcast, which nicely allows for no gray area in an ad campaign that was <laughs> red and blue. A uh, patriot or traitor, if you had to poll the room, not to go Frank Luntz on you here, but if you had to uh, <laughs> ask people if they came down on it, again, taking away the ability to have a gray area, uh, part of each, uh, how do you think the, the room would come down? Well, interestingly enough, I anticipated you asking me that question. <laughs> See, you're a crafty and, guy. You're a sharp I've guy. I've asked these people. I've passed these people as well. And it is, it is specifically the gray area that they are talking about. People here are not saying that they think that he's a patriot or a traitor, but many people are having difficulty figuring out this evening exactly what he is. Many people are questioning his motives, even though they're saying they're a bit thankful that he has done what he's done. But I think if this conversation is taking place in living rooms around the country, I think there are a lot of people who are trying to figure out exactly who and what Ed Snowden is this evening. Uh, Kevin Tibbles in Ellicott City, Maryland, a great place to stop by, especially for those either in transit between uh, Baltimore in Washington or those generally in the area. Uh, Chuck Todd, tomorrow at the White House, um, what is going to happen? What's your anticipation? What's going to be said as a result of what we have heard tonight? As Kevin noted, for some people watching tonight, this was apparent sitting across from the guy, which is why I tried to write it at the top there the way I did, that as he sat down and got mic'd up and we focused in, it struck me, this is going to be the first good, clean look at this right. guy, and even to hear his voice, to see his mannerisms that we've ever had. Now that he's an identifiable human, not shot against a pane of glass in a hotel in Hong Kong, what do you think, how, what branches of government come at this, how? Well, I can tell you the initial sort of conversations that I've already had electronically with some White House folks is it appears to me they're going to seize on the idea that he wants to come home, right? That that's essentially what they're taking away from this interview, is that here's Edward Snowden, went on a big stage to plead his case uh, to come home. And I think that publicly that's going to be what you hear them say. You know what? Uh, if he wants to come home, then he ought to come here. Then we can start negotiating uh, if that's what he wants to do. But I think they're going to seize on that for a couple of reasons, Brian. One is it is uh, the American thing to do, which is, well, come on, come on back to the States and we can, you know, you'll get a fair trial. Now, of course, Edward Snowden doesn't believe he's going to get a fair trial and wants to negotiate before he does that. But I think that that's going to be where they lean on. They don't want to debate him on the merits of what he's done. They don't want to engage and have that, have that back and forth debate. But I want to add one more thing that we haven't really talked about here, and that is um, the political, I think, mistake that official Washington made, George W. Bush's administration and Barack Obama's administration. They never had the conversation with the country, right? This was, I think, the part of Snowden that resonates, that's going to resonate with a lot of people uh, in the interview. And he brought this up. They never had this conversation about what should be the line on privacy and security uh, with the country until now when it was forced. And I can tell you there's some political advisors to the president who no longer have those White House badges, Brian, who think the president made a huge mistake last summer when he did not try to use this moment of Snowden to say, OK, let's have a real conversation about this and instead focus on Snowden, focus on some blue ribbon panel here, blue ribbon panel there. But you know what? To this day, we still haven't had the real de debate and the real conversation. And I think that that's why the president has been suffering politically. Yeah, situation. a friend of mine who's a veteran in uh, uh, the, the Democratic side of politics in Washington said that it, that's his calculation, too. The president missed a kind of populist bet to say, yep. on behalf of you, the American people, I'm going to lead you. We're going to go grab our privacy back. Snowden goes one further and says in another portion of the interview, we deserve better service from common carriers and internet providers. Uh, he mentioned parent company of NBC Universal Comcast, right. along with a slew of others, that we should have encryption if we want it. We should have uh, the, the, we are customers of these companies. We should have security in our uh, communications. I also tried to engage him 
in your area, Chuck, presidential right. politics. Right. Let's play one last portion, his answer here. Did you vote for President Obama? I think, uh, I think who people voted for is something that should be kept private. Did now, he disappoint what, you? What I will say on that um, is that whether or not I voted for uh, President Obama, I was inspired by him. Uh, he gave me courage. He gave me hope. I really believed uh, that he would be a positive force for the country. And I still hope he will be. You, however, looked at it you were hoping he would reverse some of the Bush policies. You were quoted as saying you were disappointed that he did not. Well, he said he would. And in your view, it worsened? Uh, it's been a logical progression. He's embraced some policies and he's extended other policies. Um, he's not Bush. He's his own president. Um, but the consonants in the policies should be concerning for a lot of Americans uh, because he was a candidate that promised that he would give the public back its seat at the table of government. And he still has time to do so. Chuck Todd, exactly the point you touched on yeah. going into that. I, I have to say, you know, it, it is funny. The, um, I thought that there was a, a, a part of what he said there. And when you look at what Obama has and hasn't done on this front, um, I think that he represents, interestingly enough, this demographic that we've noticed which is what, the 18 to 35-year-olds, what is he, 30 years old, who did think that, you know, Obama was going to be more anti-Washington, more transparent. Uh, and the fact is, something happens to these presidents when they get that first, you almost wonder, is it when they get that first briefing yes. from the intelligence right. community? Yeah. You know, Mike Leiter might know this. Wait. And I'll tell you, <laughs> yeah, I mean, think about it. You know, who come into the Oval Office yeah. and change these presidents in the They do. In the post you can't help era. but wonder that. You I, can't help but wonder that. So it's an Leiter's answer. fault, we've decided. Uh, it, it's well, I, have an, I actually have an answer to Chuck's question, though, as to why they haven't had this conversation, why he missed that opportunity. Snowden's exposure, the leaks, we didn't mm -hmm. know who he was then, but the Green World first stories came two days before this summit with President Xi of China. And that was the summit where the President of the United States was going to say to this new president out in Sunny Lands, California, you cannot have your military spying on our American companies. This cyber war has to stop. He was going on the offensive. They had a whole game plan. And instead, what she said to the president, I'm told, is you are the aggressor. He took the Snowden thing and ran with it. And from then on, the president's been playing defense. Because all of life goes back to either The Godfather or a Tom Hanks movie, uh, this war stops now. You know, uh, Brian, you really me. can't underestimate what it's like. I can't even understand what it's like being a president and being told these are the people who are trying to attack the country. I remember briefing the president before he was president. I remember briefing the president, getting yelled at by the president after the Christmas Day bombing because we hadn't stopped something. And that responsibility of trying to protect the nation is so heavy. And it does make it harder to go back and say, hmm, let's take away this collection. Let's scale that back. It's hard to find a silver lining in all of this from my perspective. But I do think Chuck is right, others are right. If we can come out of this with a more solid foundation of public support and trust for the security institutions that do keep the nation safe, then it's almost worth it. A couple of tweets here, Josh B. Any statements by John Kerry? Are statements by John Kerry and others blasting Snowden as a traitor and coward likely to engender even more support for Snowden? Is the government losing the PR battle uh, submitted to those watching for their approval? Nick S. on Twitter. Did you get the feeling Snowden lied when he said he couldn't access the files if he was given a laptop? Uh, a judgment business is not something I was in. He has said repeatedly he'd be a fool to enter Russia with the material. The, he, the journalists are a nice kind of foil, a way, as we put it, of putting space between him. The theft, which he admits he, he took part in, he, he did, and uh, the breaking and kind of curation, to use a hideous word, of the stories. And by the way, Brian, that creates a big problem for him legally, because as we look forward now, he wants clemency. 
which is legal forgiveness, never mind, come home, all is forgiven, yeah. doesn't seem like that's likely to happen. Uh, everybody in the administration has said no to that. So then we get into, all right, what do you have to give the United States, they'll say to him, that would make us want to play let's make a deal? Uh, he said, well, I can tell you how I did it. Maybe the government knows how he did it, maybe he doesn't. Normally in a case like this, uh, he would say, okay, here's the documents back. He can't do that now. He, by his own statement, he doesn't have them anymore. They're scattered. The, the most he could do is say to all the journalists that he's given them to, give them back to me so that at least I can give the government and say, okay, I can't give the original, but here are copies, so at least you'll know where I was, what I got, what I compromised. That's what they That's, want. But that's not a very strong negotiating position, given that he cannot control what these other people do. Let's go to the West Coast. Ambassador turned Professor McFall. Um, what's the average age of your students? How do you think uh, they'll react to Edward Snowden tomorrow morning? Well, the average age of my students here are 20, 21, so uh, that demographic, that, that 18 to 35-year-olds. Um, you know, I think they're going to have the debate we, we're having here as well, uh, which is trying to find the balance. Um, I, I will say, to, to pick up on a thread earlier, we, we spent a lot of time talking about this giant haystack and how we failed to stop this terrorist or that terrorist, and that's all very true. I would remind everybody that intelligence gathering is much bigger than that. And for five years, I worked in the government and, and benefited from lots of intelligence gathering. Um, it needs to be regulated, as we've talked about. But let's not, let's not just uh, focus on the one piece of intelligence that we've been talking about. The second piece that's striking to me uh, uh, that I think should be debated is in um, that we don't want to lose our freedoms. Who who's wants to lose their freedoms, right? When he said, I don't want to give up my freedoms. Mm -hmm. It's striking to me that we don't have a really nice, solid case study, as we would say in political science, where that happened to somebody in America that he could document. Um, and that gets me back to this capacity versus uh, what we can do uh, and what we do do. And I hope that that remains part of the debate, at, the, at, at least when I talk about it here, with my students, I'll make that part of the debate as well. Andrea Mitchell, what do you think happens tomorrow? What should happen tomorrow as a result of what we've heard tonight? Well, tomorrow and the tomorrows after that, I think we need a real debate, a public debate Imagine about that. privacy, about security, the balance, whether we have the right balance, and they need to disclose more about the structures because we are spending billions of dollars, we're losing our privacy, and I don't know if we are getting the security that we need to have against the terror threats that Michael Leiter worked so hard against? Uh, well, with that, uh, this has been a, a really interesting experiment and kind of a discussion that we needed to have after hearing that hour, which we um, uh, very, very carefully went through and submitted what we thought were the most crucial and important things that we heard from uh, Edward Call Me Ed, uh, Snowden a week ago tomorrow now in a hotel room in Moscow. We want to thank our guests, uh, those far flung and coming into us by remote, former ambassador, now Professor McFall at Stanford, uh, uh, Chuck Todd, a uh, very late night for him because he's got to get up early in the morning in our Washington bureau, Kevin Tibbles and the good people in Ellicott City, Maryland, and of course uh, Mr. Leiter. Ms. Mitchell and uh, former Supreme Court Justice Pete Williams here <laughs> with us uh, in New York. Uh, thank you all. As we said, we will leave this uh, uh, posted on the web for a companion purposes to tonight's special and for the huge team that worked to make that a good hour of television, two good hours of television tonight. I'm Brian Williams in New York. <laughs>